thinking about the anxiety of the state? Well, I think I think that the, what your talk suggests is that if we look back at what's getting blocked out, we can you know, sort of psychoanalyze the anxieties of the state regarding the population and what they have access to this information. Right? So it would be corrupted or uh, pose some threat to the stability of the government, right? Um, flipping back to 2015, I wonder what we can sort of glean about the anxieties of the current sort of surveillance apparatus by the fact that there isn't this overt form of censorship that would, you know, it's almost as if they don't fear the population at all. Uh, they don't fear being overthrown in some way. Well, that could be I, my own paranoia. I think it, the, the anxiety in the in 1915, I think, is partly a fear of instability, that somehow they could lose control. And in fact, they did. I mean, they, they ended up losing the empire. The Austro-Hungarian Empire falls, of course, at the end of World War One. But they're terribly worried about it. And they see uh, the surveillance of everybody, <laughs> mail, of their newspapers, of everything that they're doing uh, as a way of both stopping them from knowing things and undermining the morale of the people. For instance, it was censored to talk about epidemics, public health issues of any kind, as well as obvious things like where General X was on a certain night. Um, but anything that, that reflected on morale or the potential morale weakness of the population or the fighting forces was considered to be absolutely needed to be censored. On the other side, I think they're worried about not just the population, becoming organizing against the state, but the enemy. And and that the enemy, if something was known to the population, the enemy would know it too. And I've heard almost identical things from NSA officials now. He said, you know, we're not worried about the American people, but if the American people know it, then that means the Iranians and the Russians and other malefactors will, will know it as well. And one of the reasons that the censorship itself is so censored is that people begin to think that that's, that's a magic key. If you know how things are censored and why they're censored, mm -hmm. then you can begin to look for signs of it in other indirect ways. So that's why that's so exciting. Right. Because it's, we don't hide what we're hiding. People who are, who are seeking not to be found will hide themselves better. I mean, I read one person who writes to the newspapers and said that basically you're traitors by leaving these white spaces. Because everybody knows you can use these white spaces to figure out what you're worried about. And if we know that, the French know that, because the French are, if somebody published an article on this in France during World War I, he said, well then, the people we're fighting are going to know it too. And so it's stupid to leave the traces of your censor moves. I like the uh, discussion you had at the NSA and the little red guy in the center. <laughs> um, and on the one side, so I was thinking in, in terms of the self that you're describing. So when we think of the Freudian self, it's this kind of super interiorized sort of thing. And the one you show that the NSA is worried about is, um, has almost nothing to do with the interior personality. Uh, it has to do with this distributed network of, of traces, right? Yes. It's completely distributed. I think that's exactly right, too. I think the, you know, the, the, the radical, the most radical part of Freud is around an account of the ego that isn't like a mini-me inside of us, not a homunculus version of ourselves. And in fact, Freud sees, as an analogy, he says it's a little, the ego is a little bit like a weak rider on a strong horse. And every time the horse decides to go in a direction, the rider says, oh yeah, that's where I wanted to go. Yeah. And, but, the, but the ego is not in charge and oh, simply yeah. justifies or rationalizes these much bigger forces of the id and reality principle. I mean, the things, the big shaping forces. And the, so the self isn't a single thing. It's like this distributed entity. It's like a society inside the head of ego, id, reality principle pre-conscious, this whole dynamic of structure. Uh, and then people vulgarize Freud to talk about ego psychology to make it like the 
you should cultivate your ego. You, know, you should make yourself have self-confidence. That's a strong ego. But but the ego for Freud was something almost invisible, kind of thin membrane between the reality principle and the id. Our desires meet reality. And it's just that layer of nothing between them that is the ego. The ego is not substantial. But the radical part that you're pointing to of the contemporary picture is that there's there's no real interiority at all. Our inti our, the, the red profile is just a kind of switching station. It just is a, it's, it's a, it's a set of rules that take you from cyber behavior, biographical behavior, and so on, back and forth. And so the personality becomes evacuated of that sense of interior desire and forces. It's, it's just, I mean, I think of it like a matrix, like just a, a set of things that, something that takes A into B and C into D. I was wondering also about the, the extent to which that is a sort of expression of contemporary digital capitalism. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the fact, one of the things that I looked at is the way in which uh, game, video game companies, um, you know, so like it, all your, your, like your history of play in, in a bigger game you know, World of Warcraft is, is intimately recorded, all the kinds of scenes that you're good at and so forth. And then uh, that is sort of fed back to you as a user, and, and the game is modified in ways in order to keep you playing and to yes. find those weak spots where you can... So, uh, and this kind of uh, marketing yeah. principle spills over into just about everything so that there are these companies that are accumulating profiles for people and, and marketing them. You know, I think that's exactly right. They, and so I, we are this kind of distributed yes, commodity. Yes. And, and linking these things up, the programs that say map your credit history yeah. and your uh, behavior inside the store and oh, your yeah, behavior yeah. on a site like Amazon, those are that's a lot of money and effort there. I mean that's that's that tells you using a frequent user card what you do, what your credit card information is and therefore you're purchasing you know, other activities and how that links to what you do inside the casino, yeah. for instance. That's a hugely profitable thing to know. If you know somebody will spend 6.8 minutes in front of a slot machine and then go somewhere else, and how much tolerance they have for variance in their amount of money that they've got, and you can do all sorts of things to bring them back in, to make them spend more, to give them breaks, to... And that's a... In Las Vegas was one of the places along with other forms of gaming that really understood this early on. And these guys that are looking at identity admire that. They think yeah. that that's, that's, that's great. Yeah. And, they, and, the, and the NSA obviously is, or GCHQ, have much greater capacities to compute and much greater access to information. Yeah. So Andrea has one question, so actually, yeah. Yeah, Chris, yeah. I can release you. <laughs> 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 and then Anna Pump's coming with a car to give you guys the lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hi. That was such a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, so my work is primarily concerned with preemptive governance in drone warfare, counter-terror, okay. and nuclear support cases. And I'm just thinking about the relationship between censorship and projection in this context, and sort of the ways in which like, counter-terrorism and post-9-11 policy is about imagining and preempting future threats through a lot of conjectural projection in addition to more algorithmic and mathematical models. And so I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more to the current relationship between projection and censorship and the construction itself. Well, I, I think that that's, it's very central, as it is in the marketing situation. I mean, the, the, the whole domain of predictive analytics is, sort of hovers over all of this, that form of data mining. To, the whole point of it is to know what you're going to do, right. right? And how we can then make money, capture, intercept you, monitor you, whatever it is, that certain, you know, and looking for these correlations that can be buried in a lot of data noise is that is that is what they're after. So I think you're exactly right. And so what they're looking at, you know, if they know, for instance, that certain characteristic word or sentence structure use is predictive of personality type that uses risky passwords. That's incredibly valuable. You could take a list of 50,000 people and say these thousand are extremely likely to have 
stupid passwords like uh, love, <laughs> or, uh, killer, or you know, you know, you look at the ten top passwords for women, ten top passwords for men. Plug them in, and you can track a certain number of things. So sometimes you can you know, much more sophisticated versions of that could be used as they are in these things like because you're looking at like signature strikes mm -hmm. with drones, where you you say when three or more men are seen alone a distance of these many kilometers from their homes uh, carrying obscured materials, uh, then the probability is 0.32 that they're bad actors. Uh, so I think that, the, you know, that that kind, the whole point is to be able to use these correlative aspects to predict purchases or crimes or terrorist actions or um, spending money somewhere or something else. I mean, it's, so it's, it's very useful. And sometimes people underestimate what's confidential because of that. Like where you go, you might think your GPS data, who cares? But there's a huge amount you can learn from that. And if you have it for a population, you can find out who knows who. What are their friend numbers? What are their, you know, who, who do they hang out with? Um, what's going on at these different places? What draws them to them? Uh, so, a lot of times, the predictive analytics are based on things that seem discardable, uninteresting to us, and therefore not protected. You know, somebody says, what's your social security number? Oh, social security number. Someone knows when you arrived at campus every day for six months. Well, that, that might seem like nothing, but actually you could probably deduce a lot from that. Right. What your position there is, who else, who else is there, all sorts of things. So yeah, I think for, for, for questions of governance, for questions of market and capitalism, for questions of security, internal security, external security, uh, and ultimately for who we are, you know, what we need. Things that seem, sometimes it seems to me that things that seem, well that could never really shape how we think about ourselves. They do, you know, like Floyd or Rorschach tests. We, that must, that, you know, that, started it seemed like an obscure sort of cult to the small number of people but that's now we you know we use the idea of a Freudian slip uh, oh I guess it's significant you left your suitcase at this person's house yeah you know, we use that in our daily understanding even by people who say I, I don't believe a word Freud said they've already absorbed it. or the cybernetics of the 1940s that seemed like the crazy rantings of Robert Wiener and his friends but now in little network accounts and all sorts of ways, the idea that the mind is a computer with feedback structures that actually constitute our inner mental states has gotten to be a pretty commonplace notion. It doesn't seem shocking when we abandon the idea of intention being a kind of internal striving drive towards, and we're willing to sort of say, well, maybe it's just a kind of positive feedback response to certain when we use these terms, we, we think of ourselves in different ways. So I, I do think that the self is something that's constantly changing. Yeah, it's really interesting. I couldn't quite hear what you were saying over there, but in terms of this, like, where this the entire concept of the internal currently stands, mm -hmm. I mean, so much of this stuff that I'm looking at is about sort of the bureaucratization of imagination, and it's the ways in which you can project sort of these otherwise thought to be like internal realms into a future, an imagined future. Yeah. And it really seems like your work is sort of speaking to that right now as well. Yeah. When Norbert Wiener in 1944 or so made a device about the size of this table that would, you know, you would, someone would move a marker on the wall and the machine would learn the patterns, analyze the frequencies and motion and so on and then eventually be able to predict by a short amount of time, like two seconds, where you would go next with your pointer. And when Warren Weaver from the Rockefeller Foundation saw this, he said, you know, I'm going to have to cut the wires. There's something, there's a trick here. It just seemed like a miracle, <laughs> right? And so, but on that basis, Wiener and his, his gang started to think that prediction was really just a feedback system. That prediction wasn't some interior mental state that was inaccessible to a kind of scientific electromechanical analysis. And this is before digital computers, before all that. It's, this is just wires, you know, old style electronics. So, uh, I, you know, these things do change. And I think that 
the old style behaviorism died out because it was far too weak to convince anybody that really we're just versions of pigeons pecking mm -hmm. for yeah. seeds. But it's back <laughs> now in this, you know, in, in predictive analytics and in this whole range of things that removes the kind of in, in interiority and the, the sort of hidden mental states of a different scientific order from that which is accessible. And it's been replaced by these micro behaviors mapped into data sets with sophisticated mining on them, you know, and then we're it's incredible how rapidly this stuff is progressing. Yes. I was, uh, you were mentioning the uh, gate capture mm -hmm. technology and associating that with individuals. You know what? Wasn't that uh, Al Alakwi, that guy, that, that the, the cleric that they, they spotted using gate uh, matching technology uh, with a drone and took him and a bunch of other people that were collateral damage and all that? But, but you know that, and that kind of stuff now is is just available. Yeah. Right. We could, you know, it's like available for for us to use. And I mean, you know, face recognition technology. I remember the first yeah. time on Facebook or wherever it is, you see a picture with the names of people in your picture labeled. You think, holy <laughs> shit! Yeah. And then, you know, but then three months later, it's like. The, of yeah. course it's labeled. And you know, your computer's it, asking it's you. It's not surprising. Yeah. <laughs> Who's this person in your pictures that you've taken Absolutely. and downloaded onto your computer? Right. Yeah, right. It just becomes kind of part of the expectation. Yeah, I think, that, you know, to me, the really freaky part is, lately, is, well, like, so, like, you know, I just took up recently a, a, a new sport, and I, because I use Google Mail, I started playing golf. And because I use Google Mail, suddenly, I mean, I'm constantly inundated with, with golf ads, you know, and vacation ads to golf location. What? Wait, whoa. I'm just hitting the ball once in a while. You know? <laughs> and they follow you around like some, yeah, some yeah. undying dog, you know. It's a <laughs> but like the thing is, that the, the, yeah, but I, I, it's incredible how much data is out there and how this stuff is being accumulated in the people that... So the, the people, so like license, so the guy that talked here on Tuesday, right, he was talking about, about license plate readers in Oakland and so forth, and the police having them. But actually, there were, it was a private company that went around and did all of this to begin with in California, uh, and other, and then sold it to the You're going to the <laughs> <laughs>